Good evening, y'all. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. May we welcome all of you that are uh, in the sanctuary tonight and uh, those that are joining us on Facebook Live for our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, we're blessed to be alive and we give God glory, honor, and praise for watching over us and keeping us safe uh, during this pandemic season. Uh, he is worthy to be praised. And uh, we can praise him right now, uh, knowing that God has taken care of us thus far. And uh, we don't believe he's brought us this far to leave us where we are. And so we're excited tonight to be able to study the word of the Lord. And we are uh, back in the epistle of 1 John tonight. And we are in uh, 1 John chapter 3 on this blessed night. Uh, that is 1 John chapter 3. <clears throat> and we want to uh, look intently at verses 1, 2, and 3. And uh, hopefully we can, the Lord will allow, we'll be able to get through some of that tonight on this, in tonight's Bible study. We pray that all of you are doing well and uh, staying safe uh, and taking care of your family and keeping uh, your uh, social hygiene and distances that are necessary to uh, try to slow the spread of the uh, corona virus. First John chapter 3 <clears throat> and verse 1 uh, reads as this, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. <clears throat> but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, uh, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. And God bless the readers, lovers, and doers of his precious word tonight. Lord, we thank you tonight, and we praise your holy name. In fact, we sing praises to your name, for you are worthy to be praised. There is none like you. No one, nobody, no place is like you, God. And so we just come tonight in your presence with thanksgiving in our hearts, with praise on our lips, and worship on our minds. And God, we give you the glory right now. It could have been the other way. But your mercy and grace have been extended to us yet again. Even in the midst of a pandemic, you're still showing us that you are God. You're still showing us that you have all power in your hand. You're still showing us that you're able to keep us in these trying times. Thank you, Lord. Oh, to be kept by Jesus, to be kept from hurt, harm, and danger. Lord, we thank you tonight. We are mindful that many are sick tonight. Some are going through hard times. So we ask that you stretch out your hand now. Touch and heal and deliver. Remember the afflicted tonight. Remember the grieving families tonight. Be with those that are bereaving tonight. And those that are in hospitals tonight, we lift up Mother Geary to you tonight. We ask that you would touch her body right now. We are praying for Zoe tonight. God, that you would stretch out your hand even now. Give her a full recovery now. And God, everyone, name by name, you know, God, what we're all dealing with and how we're dealing with it. And except you help us, we can't make it. Except you build us, we can't stand. Lord, we ask you to help us now. If you don't help us, we can't stand the storm. So we pray that your Holy Spirit would come on in, God, inside of each and every one of us. Undergird us with your power. Lift up the bow down here tonight. Encourage the weak tonight. And build up the saints, Lord. We thank you right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. 
we give God glory tonight. Can we give him some praise tonight? <clears throat> Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Great and mighty is our king. All right, so we were, we've read in your hearing tonight, uh, 1 John uh, chapter uh, 3, and we are, have looked intently at verses 1 through 3. And I think we should uh, take note of the wording in verse 1 of this great epistle <clears throat> uh, where John says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. So we should take note of the wording here in verse 1 because here the apostle John uses the phrase, what manner of love? What manner of love? Oh, what a love God has shown to us. And the Greek word there for what manner, that's a strange way to write this particular verse uh, he could have just said oh what love but he put in there he put the word manner in there what manner of love the Greek word is pot op os which is to mean of a possible sword pot op mos uh, it's interesting because what manner is the base word for how long or at how much time God has loved us. The casual reader may overlook this phrase and, be, and, and, and miss it completely because he's saying, look at how long in every possible way that God has bestowed his love upon us. In other words, while we were yet sinners, while we were big enough to go to hell, bad enough and ready enough to go on to hell, God loved us. How long has God been loving us? And if we try to add up the years, we can't go back far enough because before the beginning began, he was already loving us. So this is the idea that John is trying to get us to see. He's trying to see, get us to see that God loved us before we knew what love was. Before we was even thought of. <laughs> before we was even created. Uh, you know, we used to sing the song, Oh, How I Love Jesus, because he first loved me. Y'all remember that one? Well, John wanted to want us to know how long it's actually been. It's been before eternity or before time even began. So look at how long God has been good to us. Look at how long God has been blessing us. Look at how long God has been taking care of us. Look at how long God has been watching over us. That's what he's trying to get us to see. He said, look at how long God has been providing for us. I mean, you have to think about, now you, I know for us, when you make it personal, you have to look at your own life and say, you know, it's been for my mother 75 years that how God has provided for me. 70 plus years how God has took care of me, watched over me, loved me, kept me. I could have been gone a long time ago. It ought to be a witness in the building tonight. You have your own testimony of how long God has been good to you and how, how long he has provided for you. And when you start thinking about how long God has been good and loving us, you have to go back and say how much I owe him. Oh, oh, oh my God. How much I owe him for his love toward me. Now, I know I can't pay him. It's not for us to try to figure out what, how much we can pay him because you can't ever pay him for all that he have done. But what you can do is tell him thank you. Hallelujah. You can give him glory for how long 
<laughs> how long in every possible way uh, he has loved us. Now, this is important because this is used in the way he phrased This is really strange how he, he writes this verse. What manner, behold, what manner of love that the Father have bestowed upon us. Like he, just, like he just threw this out here on us. Poured it on us. Overwhelmed us with it. Lavished us with his love. It is used as an inquiry position because God's love, listen, is unexplainable, indescribable, and all-encompassing. We did not deserve this kind of love. None of us did. There ain't nothing we could do to earn this kind of love. But his love was so rich and full toward us, to undeserving, wicked, sinning, uh, 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 backward-thinking people. He loved us so much that he said, I'm just going to lavish you with. In fact, I'm going to love you until I draw you. I'm going to love you until I make you love me. I'm going to love you until your eyes come open. I'm going to love you until your heart change. I'm going to love you until you repent. Lord, have mercy. And surrender and say, Lord, forgive me. That's the kind of love that God has for us. In fact, when they ask Jesus or we ask God how much he loves us, then he'll point us to Jesus hanging on the cross. They hung him high and they stretched him wide. And he hung his head and he died for you and I. Behold, what manner of love is this? Oh, what love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called, listen, the sons of God. So to those of you taking note, why did God so love us? Well, you're starting to see why. He explains, first of all, that God's love has a purpose. What is that purpose? What is that purpose? That we should be called the sons of God. He loved us so much. He loved us unexplainably, indescribably, all-encompassing, enough to where he can call us sons of God. Oh, what a love for a purpose. That we should be called the sons of God. This is the work of love. What is the work of love? The work of love is that we should be called the sons and daughters of God. The question now becomes, well, who's going to be calling us this? Well, he lets us know it's not going to be the world. The world is, it could care less about us being sons and daughters of God. The world does not care about us loving Jesus and saying God is our Savior. And the world has no regard for God nor the things of God. And, and certainly don't care about you saying you're a believer or you're a, a pastor or a mother of the church. They don't get the world that, that cares less about us being called children of God. But God loved us enough and bestowed his indescribable, unexplainable, all-encompassing love on us so that he would have the pleasure to call us sons and daughters. That's the whole point. He said, I want to love you so until I can call you my child. I can call you my son. I can call you my daughter. I can call you my beloved. So therefore, his love had been bestowed upon us in a transformative manner. Listen, his love has been bestowed upon us for the purpose that he could call us the sons and daughters of God. But we don't start out like that. We don't start out like that. We start out in rebellion. We start out lost. We start out sons and daughters of the devil. We start out on our way away from God. But God's love, this indescribable, unexplainable, all-encompassing length of love, loves us so much. Until it began to transform us into sons and daughters of God. He said, I'm going to love you until you become what I want you to be. Ooh, that's love, y'all. <laughs> you know how quick we give up on love? If you ain't what I want you to be right now, how many of y'all going to stop loving? 
Ooh, y'all got quiet quick. If somebody is not what you want them to be right then, a whole lot of times we cut off love. We say, I'm through with it. I ain't going to love you that not, not now. I'm not going to be going through all this here. I mean, you crazy as you is, I ain't got this kind of time on my hand. But God didn't do that to us. What God did, we said, I'm going to love you until I transform you. I'm going to love you until you become what I want you to be. In fact, I'm going to call you what I want you to be, even though you're not what I want you to be yet. Ooh, that's powerful, church. I'm going to call you blessed, even though you ain't where you're supposed to be. I'm going to call you my, my child, even though you ain't my child. I'm going to call you beloved and anointed, even though you are not where I want you to be yet. I'm going to love you through all of your mess. I'm going to love you through all your wickedness, all of your sin, all of your craziness. I'm going to love you through all of your debauchery. I'm going to love you through all of your wicked ways until you become what I want you to be. In fact, God will love us through all of our issues. Now, everybody in here has had some issues. Y'all ain't going to help me tonight. He loved us through all of our issues. And he worked with us through those issues and the transformative power of God. It wasn't fixed. Some of this stuff wasn't fixed overnight. Y'all ain't going to help me tonight. We weren't where we were supposed to be overnight, but he kept on loving us. He kept on drawing us. He kept on saying, come on, child. He kept on saying, get up now. Get up now. You can make it. He kept saying, come on, try it again. And he gave us more love when we didn't deserve it. Y'all ain't going to the one that's called agape love is unexplainable, indescribable, all-encompassing love. God loves every part of you so much until he is patient enough to work in areas that we have put a no trespassing sign in. God loves us so much that he's working in the dark places of our soul. The places that we have said, don't interrupt me over here, God. You can have this part of my life, but don't go in this door. God is saying, I'm waiting to get in that door. God's saying, I'm waiting on you to open this door so I can get in. I'm just going to stand here and knock until you let me in so I can work on that wickedness in that corner over there. <laughs> God is saying, I'm going to love you until you let me show you that I can do something about the things that you can't do something about. That's love, church. Real love is patient. Love is kind. Does not envy itself. Does not vaunt itself. God has given us this kind of love to say even in the crevices, in the corners, the things that you don't see about yourself, I love you in spite of all of that too. Hallelujah to the Lamb. It's a transformative love. And so he goes on in verse 2 to say, Beloved, now. Now, when is now? <laughs> when is now? He said, now are we the sons of God. But it does not yet appear what we shall be. So how can we be what we not be in? <laughs> how can I be what I'm not being? The only way I can be what I'm not being is if God is calling me what I'm not. God is calling me holy when he knows I'm not. God is calling me righteous when he knows I'm not. God is saving me even though he knows that I got, I've done enough to go to hell already. Hello, somebody. Yeah, even in the place that we don't see. See, this is what love does. He said, look, I'm going to call you what you are. You are now my sons of God. You are now my children. And it does not yet appear what you shall be. Do you realize tonight that God is not through with you yet? Somebody need to get that in your spirit. God is not through with you yet. God is not finished working on you. God is not finished working in you. And God is not finished working through you. Because it's still some more work that he needs to do in you so he can work through you. And that will bring him more glory. Hallelujah. That's why he said, look, you are my children. You are my sons. You are my daughters. And it does not yet appear 
what you shall be. You need to know tonight that you still don't know what God has in store for you. Somebody better get that in your spirit. So if I don't know what God has in store for me, how do you know what God has in store for me? So I can't live off the limitation that you have for me. I can't even live off the limitation that I have for me. I have to live off of the love of God that says, I've got some things that your eyes have not seen and your ears have not heard and neither has it in it to your heart the things that I have prepared for them that love me. I wish I had a Bible reader here tonight. Are y'all going to pray with me? Beloved, now we the sons of God does not yet appear where we shall be. So that means God got some more stuff yet on the way. Hallelujah. And as he is transforming me, he's preparing me for what he has in store for me. See, this is the work of God. His love says, I need to get you ready. Lord, have mercy. I, I got to get you ready so when the moment comes, you can glorify me at that moment. Whatever that moment is. Whatever that moment may be in your future, God said, I'm getting you ready so when the time comes, you can tell somebody it was God's love. That you, it was, if it had not been for his transformative love, I wouldn't be able to stand here today and tell you about it. It becomes a testimony for you. But we do know this, that when we, he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now here is the blessed hope. It is the hope that we will be as he wants us to be. Now, wouldn't that be, that is the whole uh, conquest and dream and desire for a real believer. To be all that God wants me to be. If I can just be all that God wants me to be. Not what people, you ain't going to please people. You got to get this right. You ain't going to ever be able to do all what people want you to do. Because they changed the standard. They changed the rule. They said, that you, you didn't do this right. You didn't add. You can forget about that. You ain't going to never be the police. Oh. But if I can be all that God want me to be. If I can be all that God want me to be, then I've done what I need to do. Hallelujah. And if it's not for me to do, then he got somebody else that's ready to do it. And so when God is at work then, it doesn't appear what we shall be. And I'm glad because it might scare some of us if God showed us what he really want to do. <laughs> yeah, everybody not ready for, for what God really got in store. So he has to hide stuff. He has to give us little by little, line upon line, precept on precept. Because if God really showed you what he really going to do in your life, it may scare you so that you say, I can't do this, Lord. This is way, I don't want all that. But God have to give it to us little by little. He know how much we can handle, how much we can take. And while that's going on, he's still transforming us, making us into his image. Hallelujah. It's a transformative work. He says we shall uh, be like him. Now this becomes... Ah, listen, the blessed hope. The blessed hope is that one day that we will be perfect in the sight of God. That's our hope. Peter calls it a lively hope. And this hope is that even though the world is falling apart around us, we have been given the assurance that God does not lie. He said, let every man be a lie, but God be the truth. And God has made promises. Y'all ain't going to help me tonight. He has made promises to the beloved and the believers that he will keep us in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. The world can fall apart, but I'm going to have peace. <laughs> the world can go crazy and upside down, but I'm going to have peace. And this peace passes all understanding. And so, therefore, there is a hope. He says in these two words, uh, we have this hope that as we would see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And then I really want to get to the verse I've been trying to get to all night, and that's verse 3. Hallelujah to the Lamb. And verse 3 is this, And every man that hath this hope in him purified himself, even as he is pure. Now, let's, let's deal with this, because this is really what I want to talk about tonight. 
Because this idea of being purified or purifying ourselves, the first thing we must do, beloved, those that's taking note, is you got to be honest with yourself. I think this is where we go wrong a lot of times. Because we're so used to trying to fool folk. <laughs> we, we're so used to faking and shaking until we don't know how to really be honest with ourselves. And some of us don't want to face the reality of what's really in front of us. Uh, when we really actually look at the mirror and see ourselves as we really is, some people get ashamed of that. Some people get afraid of that. Some people get embarrassed. They don't want to see things themselves as they really are. And so God has to put people in our lives to point out stuff Oh, God, help me tonight. That we won't address ourselves. <laughs> yeah. He'll have somebody say, now look now. <laughs> look over here at you. Now, you may have seen it, but you deny it. You may have seen it, but you look away. You may have seen it, but you justify it. Now, I'm this because of that. I act like this because of that. I say this because of that. This is just the way I am. Not with God's transformative love. See, he has pointed it out to you already. And now he got to send somebody else because you didn't deal with it on your own. Is anybody still with me tonight? So this hope then that one has will require him to purify himself. Look at verse 3 again. Now don't rush past this because I think this is what we need to focus on tonight. Verse 3 says, every man, this First John 3 and 3 says, and every man that have this hope in him purify himself. See, it's something God does, but there's other things that I must do. Listen, listen. The blood of Jesus washes us in our spirit. In fact, our spirit becomes alive through the born-again experience. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The blood of Jesus washes away our sin, and it's called cleansing. We see that in 1 John chapter 1. The word washes our hearts. We see that in St. John 15 and 3. Now you are clean through the word that I have spoken unto you. That's what Jesus said. In St. John 15 and 3, he said the word is going to clean out your heart. Yeah. See, uh, one of the ways that we remain clean is through the word. See, your word intake helps to keep your heart clean. So if you reduce your word intake, it's like dust on furniture. When the last time you dusted your furniture? Is anybody still with me in this sanctified church? Yeah, see, if you, even if you don't do anything, dust is going to accumulate on the furniture. But what the word, without the word in your heart, if you reduce your intake, dust starts to accumulate on your heart. <laughs> So every time you get in the word, what you're doing is you're dusting off your heart. You're cleaning your heart. The blood of Jesus cleans your spirit. The word is cleaning your heart. But he doesn't say anything about cleansing here. He says purify. Hallelujah. Purifying is a step further, church. What do you mean by that? How can purifying being be a step further? If you notice what we have been asked to do uh, through, the, through this pandemic is to sanitize ourselves. Hello? What sanitizing does, it is supposed to kill the bacteria 
that would create infection. Law, y'all ain't with me here. I can wash and not cleanse anything. Or I can wash and not kill anything. <laughs> you do know that, right? So that's why they put a time limit. You need to wash for such a length of time. What they're not, you're not killing anything. You're just washing it off your hand. But what sanitizing does is it kills the bacteria. And here is the same word, the root for sanitizing goes back to purity because God says some stuff I got to kill in you. Are y'all still with me here? Well, well, where are we going with this, Pastor Harvey? You got deep on it. No, I ain't deep. I'm just telling you what's going on here. He said, look, now every man that has this hope sanitizes himself. Somebody ought to say, I need to sanitize my." Long before COVID came, church, long before the, the state and the federal government said, y'all need to sanitize yourself, God told us years ago that we need to sanitize ourselves. We must purify ourselves. The blood washes us. The word cleanses our heart. So what is this sanitizing doing? What part of that is being worked on? What part am I supposed to do with this sanitization process? Well, the sanitization process has to go in the mind, church. <laughs> we have to sanitize our mind. Because once that mind get infected, Lord, y'all ain't going to pray with me tonight. With dirty stuff, with bacteria, with disease, with spiritual disease, with bad thoughts. And you wondering what in the world this crazy thought come from? You need to sanitize your mind. Let me give you some scripture. Let me give you some scripture because some of you are looking at me crazy. Maybe you got a dirty mind tonight. To be pure is to have the kind of mind that has been sanitized. Let's go to, to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, you Bible readers. Titus chapter 1 and let's look, amen, at verse uh, 15 and Titus 1 and 15. We're trying to get these minds sanitized. Now, we've got uh, all this stuff. We got this, this stuff set at the door. We got the sanitizing stations and the bathroom and in the hallway and at, at the front door. Uh, but you know what? We, you don't mess with nobody's mind, does it? We sanitize our hands. We sanitize in our face. In some cases, our neck, and so, some people even get down to your arms. But what about that mind? What if we could create a sanitizing machine for the mind? Help us, Lord. Boy, if we had a sanitizing machine that could get in there and sanitize the mind, we'd be multi-trillionaires. Y'all know that? But that mind is something that's a deadly thing. And if you ain't mighty careful, if you ain't mighty careful, it could be the reason you don't have the victory tonight is because your mind has not been sanitized. Now your heart is being washed with the word. It's dusting off that dirty place. Jesus has washed your spirit. And if you confess your, your faults, uh, confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But this mind is something you have to do. Look at Titus 1 and 15. It says, unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience, uh oh, yeah, there it is, is defiled. We can easily read this verse like this. Unto the pure, all things are pure in the mind. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure in the mind. Even their mind and conscience is defiled. A person with a defiled mind, an unsanitized mind, needs to be purified, to be sanitized. Can I give you one more scripture then we're going to get back to this? Second Peter 3 and 1. 
2 Peter 3 and 1 says this. If we get over there, it's going to read like this. The second epistle, beloved, I write unto you in both which I stir up your pure mind by way of remembrance. Everyone who has this hope, as 1 John would say, purifies himself. He purifies his mind. Sanitizing his mind. Now, we have different filters that are supposed to be installed in our homes every month. You got an uh, air conditioner or a, a central air, a heating unit. You have a filter that is there that catches what they call the return air. Brother Roy is here tonight. He knows about the filter. And that filter gets the particles that are in the air that would come in and mess up your heater or your air conditioner. If you got too much stuff on that filter, your, your system can no longer breathe. It will cake up. That filter is going to catch all kinds of stuff. And if you've, ever, so if you've ever looked at one of them dirty filters, you'll be wondering where in the world all this stuff come from. It has hair in it sometimes. Bubble gum wrappers. All kinds of dust and dirt and rocks and just all kinds of things. Carpet particles have been caught up in the filter and you have been breathing that air. Hello, somebody. You have been breathing that air that's coming, and it's coming down tonight. And we got filters. You see one back there, two back there, and I think it's a couple of them back behind us. It's catching the, it's catching the return air. Now, you would say, well, how in the world all this stuff getting in the air? Well, it's been in the air all along. It's been here before we installed the filter or even before we installed the air conditioner. In fact, if you're not in the, uh, uh, an enclosed environment, you're breathing it outside. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we breathe and take in all kinds of contaminated things. Yeah, and so what the filter does, it is going to catch that stuff so it won't mess up the system because if the system can't breathe, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to die and you're going to have to have a big bill to fix the whole thing. So every month, about every 30 days or so, you are supposed to change your air filter. What happens if I don't change it? Well, you're running the risk. You're running the risk because you're going to be in trouble. It won't be long. Something's going to happen when that whole system shut down. And the filter has to be replaced with a clean filter. You can't go back in there with a dirty filter. You can't go back in there with the one you took out. Hello, somebody. Yeah, you, you have to put one in there that's brand new. And there's, there you go to the store, you go to Walmart, you go to any of these holes, uh, uh, Home Depot or any of these stores, you're going to see there's different types of filters that you can buy. Oh, yeah, they got all kinds of sizes, and they got all kinds of quality of filters. The cheap filter, it don't catch as much stuff. Is anybody still with me here tonight? The cheap filter, you may pay a dollar twenty cent for the thing, but it ain't guaranteed to catch uh, stuff that come through there. That's right. But the most expensive filter, they say they catch everything. They catch anything. Everything is not getting through here. It's usually much thicker and much. It looks like it's got a covering on the thing. It looks like they got that thing wrapped three and four different ways. And you're going to pay a whole pretty penny for that thing to get it in there. It's supposed to go longer than the 30 days. Yeah. See, in many of us, I think tonight, some of us have changed, haven't changed our filter. That's what's going on. We have not changed our filter and we suffer, we're suffocating ourselves. Maybe the system has already shut down. Is anybody still with me tonight? And if you don't change your filter... You're going to have a dirty mind. And you're not going to be able to catch all that stuff. If you got a cheap filter, you sure ain't going to be able to catch it. So you got to get serious with this. How important is your mind? 
How much stuff are you just letting run through your mind all the time? How many conversations you in that you should not be in? Just letting this, this stuff run through your mind. How much stuff you watching you ain't got no business watching? It's just running through your mind. Yeah, how, how much stuff you listening to, you know you can't listen to that and still keep your mind right. But yet it's running through. See, it's an unfiltered mind. And a dirty mind is the devil's workshop. And so you not only have filters in your home church, we have filters in our car as well. I went to get the oil changed in one of our vehicles, or Mari's vehicle the other day, and they, 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 they said, sir, we're going to have to change the oil filter. And I said, I understand. They, so they pulled the oil filter out, and they changed the whole thing out. They put a brand new one in there, and they said, this filter is supposed to catch stuff that the other filter didn't. I said, they, so y'all done modernized the oil filters now. Yeah. Everybody is upgrading on their filters yeah. but us. Oh, y'all ain't hearing with me now. Every, even the all filter play is updating on their filter. Everybody's going to new, uh, uh, streamlined, more, more sophisticated ways to catch the grime and the muck that they can last longer. How long can we go with an unfiltered mind? COVID doesn't kill a lot of our minds. We got, we done so messed up on COVID now, we don't even come to church no more. Hello, somebody. Oh, God, y'all quiet now. The, these kind of lessons don't nobody want to talk about. But the filter is, the, the, the filter is to catch all the contaminated things that, that are already in the world. Now, you don't have to look for these things. In fact, they're going to show up on the filter. Now, you can't see it with your eyes. You can't see it. In fact, you don't see it until it's time to change the filter. See, it's working when you don't even see it. It's working as long as that system is running. It's still catching stuff that you don't even see that you could be breathing at night. And do you know that stuff will get all in your lungs? It'll mess with your asthma and your sinuses. It'll have your ears hurting and head hurting. And your pressure will build up in your head. It could be because you haven't changed your filter. In a spiritual sense, the same holds true. It contaminates other areas of our mind. The mind, once it gets contaminated, it starts to mess with other areas of your life. Are y'all still with me here? That's why Romans 12 and 1 said we must be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And this is the work of purifying ourselves. And so as we read in 1 John 3, uh, 3 and 3, he said that every man that had this hope would purify himself even as he is pure. Now, if I'm pure, why do I need to be purified? Because God is calling me what he knows I'm not yet. <laughs> but he has enough work in me. He's working on me enough to know that if I just love him through this, if I love her through this, then they're going to work on those areas in their life that they know they're falling short in. Can you be honest tonight and say, Lord, I love you enough that I'm willing for you to work on me, for you to make me into the person you would have me to be? That's the purification process. This purification process has a way to bring about all of the, the, the crevices to get into the areas where you and I have tried to cover up. God said, that's where I want to get to make you into who I need you to be. So this purification process, he calls it the, the hope that is inside of us. Every man has to have this hope will purify himself. So the blood is washing my spirit. The word is washing my heart, but I must consecrate my mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And that work of the mind is to cast down imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. 
and I cannot cast down anything in my mind if I'm not honest. Are y'all still with me here tonight? You have to be honest with yourself. The purification process begins with you being honest. And then the second part, remember, honesty was number one. Number two is you got to be humble. Oh, Lord, 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 Lord. You have to be humble. You have to be humble. After you are honest, because some people are honest, they say, well, I know I ain't where I need to be, but you're haughty with it. I know I ain't where I, I, I'm just, I'm all messed up. That's a haughty spirit. See, it should reduce you to humility. When you see that you're falling short or you're not where you're supposed to be, that's not something to take pride in. See, that's what scares me with this modern church. Everybody, well, you know, we all messed up. We sinners saved by grace. Just go on out here and just do all the sin you want to do. Hello? That's a haughty spirit, and a haughty spirit come before a fall. It's not saying that you be proud of being uh, not where you're supposed to be. It ought to create in you a sense of humility. So, Lord, help me, because I don't want to be like this. Is somebody still with me here tonight? Having the effect, therefore, these beloved, these precious promises, the scripture said, let us cleanse ourselves from, of the filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That's in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. If we know that we are not where we're supposed to be, it ought to create a sense of humility in us. It's a Lord, work on me. Help me now, Lord, because I realize I'm not where I'm supposed to be. And I understand that there are some things in my life, in my heart, and some, sometimes even in my mind, that these things just keep creeping up and coming in places that I was unaware of. So help me now, Lord. And as you pray and the Holy Spirit comes in and you install the filters of your life where they need to be, and you begin that process of purification. Every man that has it hope within himself will purify himself. And you start sanitizing your mind and sanitizing your thoughts and sanitizing your imaginations and sanitizing your fantasies and all of these things. You just start sanitizing that before God. Say, Lord, I'm honest with you. These thoughts are not like you and I need you to help me with these thoughts. Is there anybody going to be honest tonight? That's how you get the victory. It starts with being honest, and then honesty should bring back a sense of humility. And that humility will say, Lord, I know you are not finished working on me. But as you work on me, this is number three, it's going to bring about a new hallelujah. Somebody tonight need to get it in your heart that God is preparing you for a new hallelujah. See, you need another hallelujah. You need another hallelujah that is directly connected to the sanctification and sanitizing of your mind. <laughs> I know we got a whole lot of hallelujahs. He brought me through this. He brought me through that. He blessed me with this. He blessed me with that. But can you give him a hallelujah for getting down in the crevice of your mind and doing some work in your mind? That's a new hallelujah. Now the thoughts I used to think. Hello, I don't think no more. I know we said the places I used to go, I don't go no more. The things I used to do, I don't do no more. But how many of us are here tonight to say the thoughts I used to think, I don't even think them anymore. That will bring about a new hallelujah. A whole level of, another level of hallelujah that has never come out before because this is the purification process. It's a hallelujah that's coming out of honesty and it's a hallelujah that's coming out of humility. And God can get the glory out of that. That's why I love this kind of lesson tonight because everyone who has this hope within himself 
will purify himself. See, I don't, have, I don't need everybody to point this out to me because God is pointing it out to me. And if I'm honest enough, and if I'm willing and humble enough, then God will continue to say, okay, now let's work on this other stuff over here. <laughs> Look at somebody say, you got some other stuff too now. You do. You, you do know you got some other stuff, right? Yeah, you got some other stuff. I'm talking about the stuff that you, you, you hadn't been honest with yet. Oh, God, help me now. I ain't talking to the fake you. Let's get to the real you. The, 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 the you that's you when ain't nobody looking you. See, that, that's what we got to get to. That's the other stuff that God said, if you just let me work on this other stuff over here, then you'll have another level of hallelujah. Because I'm going to bring all of that to the, to the point where it becomes pure and I can make you into who I want you to be. And I got to deal with that if I'm going to take you to where I need to get you. Yes, sir. See, I can't get you there if, I don't, if you don't let me deal with this stuff now. Because if I don't deal with it now, when you get there, you can't stay there. Ooh, hallelujah, somebody. Yeah. See, see you got to be honest. If you're sneaky, just say you're sneaky. If you conniving, just say I've been conniving. If you've been dishonest, just say I've been dishonest. If you've been lying, just say I've been, I've been lying. But God want to work a work inside of me. And he want to work a holy work inside of me. And that work that he's working inside of me is to create in me a clean heart and a clean mind. Sanitize us tonight, God. Somebody ought to help me say sanitize my mind. I need God to sanitize my mind. I need God to sanitize my thoughts. I need God to sanitize my imagination. I need God to even get down in my dreams. I need God to work on every crevice of every imagination on the inside of me. Because I don't want nothing between me and my Savior. I don't want nothing between what God got in store for me. I don't want nothing to be the hindrance to where God said, I could have did this for you. But your mind was in the wrong place. This is the perfecting of holiness in the fear of God. And that's why John would say it like this. He says, he that abided in him also himself also to walk even as he walked. Jesus had a clean mind. You remember we used to sing the song, What You Do, Lord, Do With a Heavenly Mind. Y'all remember that? Do with a heavenly mind. What they were saying is, Lord, I want you to take over my mind. Hey, give me a sanctified mind. A sanitized mind, a pure mind. A mind with holy thoughts, righteous thoughts. I want to do the right thing. And I want to think the right thoughts that glorify you and call your name holy. Thank you, Lord, for this lesson tonight. We praise you, Lord, because even in this work we see that there's some sanit sanitation that needs to take place. Not just washing, not just dusting, not even just cleaning, but God, we need some sanitizing. To kill the bacteria. To kill the things, the germs. To kill those thoughts that are not like you. To kill the places that, that do not produce fruit in our lives. To kill those pests that would destroy our future. So Lord, we are praying tonight that you would help us to sanitize our minds. Many of us got clean hands but dirty minds. Some of us got sanitized lips but we got dirty minds. Help us, oh God. Clean our ears. Clean our eyes. Clean our mouth. Come on the inside and work on our minds, God. From the inside out, do a work. And as you work on us, help us to purify ourselves. Yes, 
even as we are pure in your sight, knowing that this is just the beginning of a new hallelujah. That this is just a few steps toward a greater victory. That we can be honest with ourselves. And if we can be honest with ourselves, we can be honest with others. Help us tonight, God. To bring about that humility that says, I know I'm not where I need to be, but I'm humble about it. I know God want to do more work in me. It's a great work, and I, I need to remain humble with this thing. We come against that haughty spirit tonight. We come against pride tonight. We come against arrogance and conceit tonight. Oh, Lord, help us, Lord. Help us as a church family to realize that power is in humility. Lord, help us now. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen.